Thank you, Jacques. And now for our last but not least panel, David Benatar, speaking for the motion. Thanks. Uh, so uh, there is a distinction, I think, to be drawn between whether uh, meat should be off the menu and whether we should eat meat. But I think uh, that may be too pedantic a distinction for our purposes. The way I've understood the topic is to put it, uh, is, is just kind of an interesting way of putting the question about whether we should be eating meat. So I've understood the question in that way. You might draw the distinction, but I don't think we need to, to draw that particular distinction in this case. There are lots of good arguments for why we shouldn't be eating animals, for why they should be off the menu. Uh, some of those are environmental arguments, uh, which uh, Brett has uh, eloquently presented to us. Others are health arguments, which we've heard some about this evening. Uh, in general, it is a healthier lifestyle, both for the individual uh, consumer, but also for our species, because there are lots of uh, diseases, uh, infectious diseases, zoonotic diseases, that originate from animals and jump the species barrier to humans, and they do so because of our consumption of meats, especially on a large scale. And we could avoid these sorts of problems. But I want to focus on what I take to be the heart of the ethical question, and that is to say our treatment of animals themselves. And there are uh, millions of animals, billions of animals in fact, many billions of animals that are killed uh, every year uh, for human consumption. Let me focus just on South Africa. In South Africa, well in, in excess of a billion animals are killed annually for food after having lived lives of misery and torment. That's 2.6 million pigs, 2.9 million cattle and calves, over 6 billion sheep, lambs and goats, a billion broiler chickens, and about 480 million fish. They don't count the individual fish, of course, but we can calculate it from tonnage and then the average size of, uh, of fish. So large numbers of animals are killed. Excepting the fish, uh, most of them have suffered unbearably during the course of their, of their lives. It's interesting that in the debate tonight, uh, there seems to be agreement that the suffering is unacceptable. And I'm not going to therefore focus on the suffering. Let's just take that as a given, that it is unacceptable. Uh, we're not in debate about that. Of course, there's some practical implications of that. If you think the suffering is unacceptable, then there are immediate changes you have to make to your diet. You can't say, I'm opposed to suffering. I don't believe we should be eating animals that have suffered, and yet continue about your ordinary shopping and eating habits. If you're serious about this, if this is an argument that you're seriously committed to, then you need to recognize, uh, if I'm going to eat meat, I've got to source it from uh, these very rare outlets uh, that uh, Brett was speaking about. So there are practical implications here. You can't hide the generalized activity of eating meat behind this caveat that there may be some circumstances in which you think it is uh, permissible. Now, clearly, we're treating animals in ways in which we would never treat human beings. So let's set the suffering issue aside and let's look at just the killing of animals. Let's assume they could be reared painlessly and let's assume that they could be killed uh, uh, painlessly as well. I don't think that's actually possible on the scale that, uh, that uh, currently predominates, but let's assume that you could eat much less meat and eat it from animals that have been sourced in this way. Would that be acceptable? Well, let me ask you this. Would it be acceptable to eat humans that had been reared humanely and then slaughtered humanely? And I don't think that anybody here in this room would seriously say that that would be acceptable. And so the question is, what is the difference between a non-human animal and a human animal that can justify this differential treatment? One characteristic that somebody might suggest is that uh, humans have higher level cognition than animals do. This is the very argument that Jacques Rousseau was referring to. Uh, humans are self-aware self -aware in the way in which many animals are not. This argument, though, is an unfortunate one because clearly the elevated cognition is not a mechanism for separating all humans from all uh, non-human animals. There are many humans that don't have these higher order levels of cognition, that are not self-aware. It's true of all human babies, but if you think you want to invoke a kind of potentiality argument and say that those babies have the potential to be self-aware, well, it's certainly not true of some babies, those who will never develop those capacities. It's also not true of those human beings that have lost the capacity of self-awareness or have lost the higher levels of cognition. Uh, they don't have this very feature which you are suggesting would differentiate humans from animals and thereby war warrant the painless killing of the animals. If you thought that cognition, self-awareness, that these things really were what counts, then you would need to say that it is okay to kill humans uh, who fit into the category of not being self-aware 
as long as you did it painlessly after having reared them uh, painlessly. I don't think there are very many people who are willing to uh, accept that implication, and those who say they're willing to accept that implication are probably hiding behind the cover of it being legally prohibited and therefore in practice not being committed to testing uh, this declaration that they make. So why should we not kill uh, sentient beings, beings that are capable of feeling, of experiencing, whether they be humans or non-human uh, animals? Well, uh, Jacques Rousseau has introduced the idea that because they're not self-aware, perhaps it is okay to kill these beings. And I can't give you a knockdown argument, a definitive argument, to say that uh, killing these beings is wrong. I can't even give you a knockdown definitive argument that killing one of you or killing me would be wrong. There's an interesting philosophical argument, an ancient philosophical argument, which says that death is never a harm. Dying in certain ways may be harmful, but ending somebody's life, somebody dying, even painlessly, is not harmful. Uh, there's an interesting argument for that, uh, for that conclusion. I'm not going to elaborate on that now. The point is that we can't be sure that that argument works. There's lots of ongoing philosophical debate about an argument of that kind, and we're certainly not going to... Uh, err on the side of, of uh, being cavalier and taking lives in the hope that this argument is true. When we've got a kind of contested philosophical issue of this kind, uh, you want to err on the side of caution, I think. And the side of caution here is to say, well, maybe it's not a harm for me to kill you painlessly in your sleep, but I could be wrong about that. And if I could be wrong about that and I've killed you, I may have done something very, very serious to you, so I ought to desist really from killing you. And I would say something similar about an animal an animal that's not self-aware and a human that's not self-aware. Perhaps we do do no harm to them uh, by killing them painlessly. But there's no knockdown argument for that, and we should err on the side of caution, particularly since we can err on the side of caution, particularly since we can uh, meet all our dietary needs, we can live perfectly healthy lives without consuming the flesh of animals, whether they be human animals or, uh, or non-human animals. So I don't think that if we focus just on the death question, we've got a compelling argument here for permitting even restricted consumption of animal flesh. There may be those very rare occasions where you, let's say, grow the meat in a, in a Petri dish, some sort of futuristic picture, but then similarly growing the human flesh in a Petri dish might also be acceptable they, uh, from a moral point of view. Might be. There are other arguments we can investigate there, but that's science fiction for now. Certainly uh, we don't have meat of that kind on a large scale, so we can set those kinds of concerns aside. Perhaps there may be an argument to be made about eating roadkill, an animal that's been killed accidentally. Uh, but then again, similar arguments might apply to killing humans, to eating humans that have been killed accidentally. And those raise a separate set of ethical questions, one that I'm not going to engage uh, this evening. But to kill an animal in order to, uh, to satisfy your uh, nutritional desires, not your nutritional needs, that seems to me to be uh, completely uh, unacceptable. Now, uh, there are lots of fallacious arguments that have been presented to us tonight. Let me know when that nine minutes is up and I'll speak till then. <laughs> because there are many more than, than we have time for. Uh, yes, we do live in a democracy, and in democracy you do have freedom of speech uh, granted to you. And you also have freedom of choice, but within constraints. So my freedom to choose does not include uh, the choice to kill you. If I want to kill you, a democratic society is justified in stopping my doing that, even if I protest that I'm doing it uh, painlessly, painlessly to you. <laughs> it might be a great amount of pleasure to me, but <laughs> I'm, I'm still not allowed to do it. I'm still not allowed to do it. So uh, democracy has its uh, limitations. Uh, we've also had some false dichotomies presented to us. So we've been told, for example, that the choice is between eating meat that comes from factory farms or eating meat that comes from sustainable uh, sources. That's what we call a false dichotomy. It's not the only choice that we have. We, they have, we have a third option, and the third option is to desist from uh, animal consumption entirely. One final point, since my time is nearly up. Uh, I have not made the claim that the lives of those beings that are not self-aware have the same value as the lives of beings that are self-aware. It's entirely possible that self-aware beings have uh, more value than those that are not self-aware. But that doesn't mean to say that those that are not self-aware have no value. And when we're speaking about just desires, you want to satisfy a desire to eat uh, flesh, uh, then you don't have a good reason for overriding the value that that animal life has. Uh, it has all the value that that animal um, 
uh, it, it sees in it. That life is all that animal has, and it cares a great deal about it, even if not as much as you do about your life. Thank you. And then they are to opt for eating meat. If you want to ignore science and the ethics, then consider the most important reason of all, your humanity. Reclaim your humanity. Compassion isn't just a 10-letter word. It's not even a choice. It's a duty. We have an obligation, a duty, to be kind, to be considerate, and to be less selfish. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we lived in a world where those qualities were the rule rather than the exception? And you know what? It starts on your plate. So let's break the vicious violence cycle. Let's get a product of exploitation and destruction off our menus and out of our lives. If you believe you are what you eat, then the flesh of another obtained through violence, blood, fear, and death shouldn't even be a consideration. Veganism isn't the worst thing that can happen to you. So since you don't like meat, since you don't condone, condone cruelty, and since science shows us that getting animals off our menus is the best way to go, then why not just go vegan? If not for the animals, for you. Exercise your right to choice in a kind, gentle, and selfless way. Choose vegan. It literally changes lives.